by means of alcohol in games of chance and to turn you away from remembrance of Allah and from the prayer. Will you then stop doing that? And again, and in this verse, it's several things are stressed. Not only the association with shaitan, but when it says, Innama yururu shaitan. It says, shaitan only desires to cause an enmity amongst you. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the end of this verse, he says, Fahil antum muntahum. It says, you, will you then desist from this? So again, massive commandment, prohibition upon Muslims to keep away from from the notion of this gambling transactions. Now, what was very interesting of this Jerome Kerville thing is that they've lost all pretense from saying that this is investment. Because you even see the language of the commentators. Jerome Kerville was taking bets in the market. Now, bets in the market are actually taken in something called a betting shop, a turf accountant in the sort of the quaint language that they used to do. So these banks have now become betting shops, effectively. So the traders are not actually seeking to mitigate risk, are not seeking to seek a return via investment into real businesses or, or providing a service like foreign exchange, but are actually taking positions in terms of which way the market will go, which way the exchange, foreign exchange rates will move, and so on and so forth. So is it any wonder that we will see increasing levels of loss? Now the last point I will make about this is that we will not see, this is not the end of it. The problem that we face at the moment is that this 500 trillion flea on the back of the 500 trillion market that we have out there is getting larger and larger. And we have something called systemic risk associated with that. Systemic risk means that there's a counterparty risk. Credit default swaps are a large part of this derivatives market. It's a form of insurance, effectively. You know, it, a, a, a company issues a bond, and credit defaults is actually ensuring that that company does not default on that bond. If it defaults, then the person who printed the credit default will have to pay. We're talking about multiples of trillions of dollars. I mean, the subprime market was bad enough, 400 billion, some people say. But these large insurance agencies like MBIA, and back. They are covering these credit default transactions to the tune of trillions of dollars. So what happens if they fail? What happens then if municipal governments have to take back these bonds? What happens if, if certain banks actually fail out there because they've got not billions of exposure but they get exposure to trillions of dollars of, of loss? You can have a domino effect in terms of failure. And it's not going to be a credit crunch which we're facing at the moment. It could be a complete financial meltdown. People will not know what is going on there in terms of what is money, who has it, who is, who is stable, who is insolvent, and so on. So the whole thing could be um, seriously at risk. I want to just summarize and end by a few quick words for us. So I've talked about credit creation, I've talked about the, the dangers of the fiat currencies, I've talked about this gambling culture in terms of the, the credit markets and in terms of what's, what's happened today. There's, there's another point here which, which has to be borne in mind, is that, that is that in this time of all times is one in which the Muslims need to be taking the lead. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this uh, uh, economic system which will enable us to uh, not only transact amongst ourselves, but to give a, an example to the rest of the world. You know, 10 years ago we had an Asian financial crisis. We had our fingers badly burnt because we had fiat currencies, because we had stock markets, we were known as an emerging market. We didn't have any credit limits or control. People could plow into those markets with massive amounts of currency. People could go out and actually um, short sell those markets. Even though Rasulullah he said explicitly in one hadith, do not sell that which you do not have. So how can you enable somebody to have a market in your currency or in your assets and selling them when they don't have them? Short selling is when somebody sells something that they don't have and they, they sell it in such a massive scale that when the market dives, they go back in and they buy it and then they settle their transaction. Islam prohibits it absolutely. Yet 10 years ago, Malaysia, Indonesia, the whole of the Southeast Asians, they subject to this because speculators like George Soros and company went in there and attacked their currencies, attacked their stock markets, 
and, and, we, and they've been suffering ever since. Did we learn from that? No, we didn't learn from that. Did they move on to the gold standard? No, they didn't move from the gold standard. Did they change or regulate their markets in terms of the investment, in terms of what is a proper form of company structure? No, they didn't do that. Did they implement in terms of notions of exchange control? They did have some, some exchange controls they implemented, but it's very short-term matter. They didn't tackle the issue of the currency itself, which is open to that type of speculation, which means that those governments are in on the same trek, doing the same thing. Now we see these sovereign wealth funds bailing out these large banks. Is this a good use of the wealth of the Ummah? Where is the manufacturing? Where is the industry? Where is the real business in our countries? We, Alhamdulillah, we have oil wealth, but what is it being used for? Is that oil wealth now to be used to prop up the banks like Citibank, JP Morgan, Mer Merrill Lynch and so on, to enable them to have, go some merry-go-round with this currency? So that betters, some glorified casino can, can hedge and inflate their bets? Is this a function of this wealth which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that all of the people are partners in that? Of course not. And where is the intellectual leadership from the Muslims in terms of what is going on? I said earlier that 45,000 people, probably families, are going to be losing their homes this year. This recession could last years. Some of them do last years, which means that there will be businesses contracting. There will be people losing their business. There will be people losing their homes. There will be people penniless out there. Why? Because they're feeding the flames of a banking system which is out of control. And the government is not in, in charge of that. Where is the fiscal prudence? Where is the monetary prudence which only the Islamic system can provide? And where are the Muslims in terms of going out there and discussing these issues and debating these matters and letting these people see that it doesn't have to be that way? That over the Khilafah system, over centuries, we had stability in terms of currency. We had stability in terms of lack of inflation. We had stability in terms of investment outlook and trading outlook amongst people. And alhamdulillah, people came to Islam in this very region I touched upon. Indonesia, Malaysia, they came to Islam on the back of seeing the honesty, the integrity of Muslim traders which went to this region and carried the Islam and carried the Dawah to these people. So where is that leadership that the Muslims should be putting forward today? Shame on us that that leadership is not coming forward when this, when this uh, currency crisis is hitting. So really we have to take upon this responsibility as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you indeed are the best nation brought forward as witnesses for mankind because you command what is right, you forbid what is evil, and you, and you believe in Allah. So, this is maybe a few words of, of a lesson for us.